Okay. So your your Measure U committee members are Diane Graff, 25 points. Dan Goodrich, 17 points. Eric Gosh, 15 points. Suzanne Cosma, 14 points. Jim Leinberger with 14 points. Marie McDonald with 12 points. And George Clark with 11 points. Okay. Uh, Council, I'll just add that uh, the way we went about doing this is both the clerk and I separately looked through your sheets, did a summary sheet, tabulated all of the votes, double-checked each other, did the math, double-checked the math, did it separately, uh, and then ranked them in order of one through seven, which the clerk just announced. Your individual tabulation sheets and our summary sheet will be available at the end of the meeting, should anybody want to review them, okay. uh, or they'll be in the clerk's office in case anybody else wants to review them as well. And the next oversight committee is when? We don't have one scheduled. We are waiting until this got appointed. Okay. But it, we'll work with this new committee and make an appointment. Or Great. Meeting. Thank you. Now that that's over, <laughs> we will go on to, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we always appreciate those people that step up and want to and be a part of engagement in city in what happens in the city. Uh, so we appreciate everybody that came in tonight and put in their applications. Um, it's uh, seven's not a whole lot of people uh, in one sense, but enough to do the job. So, again, we appreciate those that applied. And um, I think there is it every two years? Or, yeah, every two years. And so those that didn't get on, we'll look forward to perhaps next time. And, um, again, thanks for coming out and um, going through the process. Okay, with that, we'll go to, on to um, the public hearing. City, city manager, you have staff? Good evening, Mayor and Council. At the September 25th City Council meeting, the City Council approved the 2018-19 CDBG substantial amendment, <clears throat> excuse me, and the revised draft annual action plan. Both documents were available for public review comment for 30 days from October 1st through October 31st of 2018. The public hearing notice was published on October 1st of 2018, and the public hearing was scheduled for November 13th. However, the time frame to submit the documents for the November 13th meeting lapsed and we had to reopen the public review and the 30-day comment period again uh, from December 1st of 2018 to December 30th of 2018. Tonight we're requesting a public hearing be conducted to elicit comments from citizens, public agencies, and other interested parties regarding the CDBG substantial amendment and the revised draft of the uh, 2018-19 annual action plan. In addition, we're requesting the council to accept and approve the 1819 annual action plan from its revised draft version to a revised final version. This will allow us to implement the substantial amendments and provide the additional assistance to our community. And with that, I can answer any questions that the council may have. Does anyone on the council have any questions for Lorena regarding this item? Number 18. And with that, I'll open the public hearing. And um, are there, is there anyone that wants to speak yes. in favor? Mayor Wright, Mayor Pro Tem Brown, members of the City Council, my name is Gail Hepner. I'm the Executive Director of the Center Against Sexual Assault of Southwest Riverside County, located at 1600 East Florida in Hemet. 
I just wanted to come forward and thank the council for considering this amendment. It includes funding for CASA that is used to help support the on-call costs of forensic nurses so that forensic exams for victims of sexual assault can take place here in our community rather than requiring victims and our law enforcement officers to leave the valley to travel either to Moreno Valley or to Murrieta for those exams to take place. And so I just wanted to thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Sarah, is there anyone else? Moving forward, is there anybody in opposition of anything on that, uh, regarding anything on that item? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. And so, you have anything to add? No. Just, there's a motion there. I'd be. Okay. So we have um, a motion for item B of item 18. I'll make that motion. Okay. Please vote. And that passes 5 0. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Now we have item 19, general plan amendment, um, consistency zoning. Council. I'd like to uh, do one presentation, uh, if it meets your pleasure, of both 19 and 20. They are interrelated items, and I think it's a little easier to understand comprehensively than uh, one at a time. So this is the, we, we term the consistency zoning project. It's for general plan amendment 18-001 and zone change-018-001. I'm going to attempt to give a very broad <laughs> overview in the interest of time and attention. And uh, however, as I think you can see from the amount of information and the work that's gone into the staff report, we have analyzed every single one of the parcels. And I do want to give a shout out before I forget to Nancy Gutierrez right here. Uh, with MIG, she's our contract planner. This has been a labor of love for her and helping us with the zoning arts amendments and all the changes. And she has looked at every single one of those 25,000 parcels in the city multiple times. Uh, also to Tim Darden, who's our GIS, the city's GIS uh, analyst, and uh, his help in developing the maps. Okay, so back in January 2012, uh, City of Hemet completed a comprehensive update to your general plan, which guides the city's long-term growth and includes goals and policies uh, designed for build-out, which we set as a horizon year of 2030. Although there's uh, multiple different elements uh, to the general plan, the one that's most related to the zoning is the land use element, which is where the land use map is. Uh, so the land use map shows how the city wants to distribute residential, commercial, industrial, and at what density or intensity. There are 21 general plan designations, seven residential of various densities, five commercial, three industrial, and six public and open space. So here's what your adopted general plan looks like currently. And it, 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 for the public, it is online. It's available uh, at the city offices as well as the huge document that goes with it. State law uh, does require that a city zoning ordinance and map has to be consistent with your adopted general plan. And even though that's been uh, law on the books for quite a long time, you be, may be surprised that a number of cities and counties and other jurisdictions never accomplish this task. And now we know why, <laughs> because it does take a considerable amount of time and effort uh, to get to that point. And in looking at the city zoning map, when I, we first started this effort, there were a number of things that just were incorrect and needed to be corrected. Whether or not we were trying to get consistency with the general plan, I think you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. 
But uh, so we started this process after the adoption of the general plan in the first phase was to bring all the zoning ordinances, that's all the text, up to date with the general plan. So there was a number of different uh, zoning categories that had to be added and designated. For example, we had a general plan designation a business park, but we didn't have a comparable zoning, so we created that. And so many of you were there with us through the past 29 zoning ordinance amendments that were approved through the Planning Commission to the City Council. That was completed uh, phase one. Phase two was now to work on the maps, to actually get the land use designations uh, consistent on the zoning map and the general plan map. So this public hearing, I know it's kind of wonky and there's a lot of terminology, but for us it's really exciting because this is the culmination of a multi-year effort. And I really do think it will be a benefit to the community and to the property owners uh, in moving forward. Okay, so this is the current zoning map. What looks like black is only because it's very small, so there's all the parcels there, so it doesn't translate well in a PowerPoint, but all, there's 25,000 parcels. Each parcel on a zoning map has a zone district designation, uh, such as R3, which is for multifamily residential, or C2, which is general commercial. That correlates with the municipal code section and that provides the regulatory standards. So um, then that also would correlate with the general plan land use. So this is kind of the process that we underwent here. There's 25,548 parcels that we're representing here in the red. Of those, 16,247 parcels were already consistent with the general plan. So we didn't have to do anything else with those parcels. Then there's 8,066 parcels um, that uh, needed minor technical amendments or changes to the zones. Then that drills down further to 675 parcels that needed a zone change for actual general plan consistency. So the real kind of normal consistency zoning task would have been 675 parcels as opposed to the almost 9,000 parcels that we had to go through. Um, then 402 of those in the orange where we actually um, in re-examining it, determined that based on the existing uses on the property or the surrounding uses to retain the existing zoning and amend the general plan. So in that case, we went the opposite direction. That's why you have a general plan amendment. And then finally, we have 156 parcels where it's consistent with the general plan, but we think there's a better fit, a better zoning category uh, to represent that. So. Now I'm going to go through all, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> so what this map shows is um, this is an illustration of all the parcels that are currently consistent with the general plan that we didn't touch, didn't change. The minor technical changes, whoops, uh, are, we had four categories. Those are 85% of the zone changes. And the four categories were the, the district, the zone district name changed to be more compatible with the general plan. Then another one was previously annexed from Riverside County. There's a number of parcels that when they were annexed from the county of Riverside, it was, for example, for residential, it said R1C, C being county, but it didn't tell you anything about what really that zone district was. So we re removed, and there was nothing in the zoning code that said R1C. So we removed the C and we fitted those in with what the appropriate zoning district would be. Uh, the residential zone desk, designations um, to add a minimum lot size. So a lot of the city's residential zoning, as I mentioned, was just R1. But that doesn't really tell the property owner or the reader or the staff much because they're usually associated with lot size. So those then change to the appropriate lot size designation. So there's R15, R16, R17.2. So R16, for example, being minimum lot size of 6,000. So now when somebody looks at a map, you don't have to have a second interpretation. They'll be able to know exactly what their zoning district is. And then we had zone district changes to reflect the existing land use. So there was also a surprising amount <laughs> of parcels to where the zoning didn't match what was built on the property. So we corrected that. So that when somebody came to the counter and wanted to do something, we wouldn't be looking at 
development standards that didn't match anything of what they already had. I don't know how it got that way. Just know that we fixed it. So um, that was a considerable amount. So for these four categories, which again is 85% of the changes we're presenting, there's no real change in the land uses or development standards. These are really kind of technical corrections. Okay, so then we have the zone changes um, for consistency zoning. So these were the parcels that needed to come into conformance with the general plan. And then we had another category in your staff reports referred to as category five. This is 156 parcels that I mentioned where the zoning is consistent with the general plan. Most of these were in the commercial designation. So for example, the general plan is community and commercial. You can either have C1 or C2 consistent. A lot of the par properties that were zoned C1 were at major intersections like at State and Stetson. So in order to give those property owners and businesses the ability to have a broader range of commercial, um, we're recommending it be changed to C2. So it could stay C1, we just think this is a better zoning category and gives them more flexibility. So that's the 156 parcels. And most of those are commercial. Again, it's hard to see, but they're noted in the red here. This is kind of a fine tuning. Now we come to the general plan amendment. So that's the zoning picture. And as I mentioned, uh, in going through all of these properties, we really tried to reexamine everything again and where we thought that uh, for whatever reason the general plan didn't accurately take into consideration the existing land uses or the surrounding neighborhood, or we thought that there was a better fit, we're recommending a general plan amendment. That's for 1,003 parcels covering 702 acres. 94% of that, or 957 parcels, are already developed. And so the map changes we're recommending will reflect those actual land uses, which again, just brings it much easier for the property owners in terms of um, any changes or modifications they want to do or loans that they want to get or anything else, it's all consistent. Then there was 46 parcels or 4.6% that are vacant and create the opportunity for infill development. So we reevaluated that to see what would be the most appropriate use or density given the characteristics of the site and the surrounding area. Uh, there's a table in your staff report that designates all of those 46 parcels and how we've adjusted everything. Uh, primarily, it's a shift from very high density residential to lower density residentials and some minor adjustments in some of the commercial and, and uh, industrial where it was misdesignated. Um, okay, so again, one of our inverted pyramids here uh, showing that the vast majority um, of the, is, you know, really just coming in in conformance with what, what the existing development is. This shows the proposed general plan map changes and kind of their orientation and where they're located. And this is, can it be it? Um, oh, the vacant parcels. Okay, that's the location of the vacant parcels. Okay, so for the, for where we amended the, let me, excuse me, let me back up. When we adopted the general plan in 2012, we did it EIR for all of the general plan at that build out at those designations. So where we were now changing the general plan or recommending changes in the general plan, we needed to go back and evaluate that again from a CEQA standpoint to look at those 46 parcels. So hired a consultant to look at that and based on, and you've seen the charts and things and how many, the, it, it was an overall lowering of density or intensity, so it was determined there was no new or additional in, environmental impacts or mitigation measures required as a result of the general plan amendment. So that allowed us to adopt what's called an addendum. So the final EIR is still in place. This is just an addendum that addresses uh, the general plan amendment. So as we do, we had actually a few workshops before the planning commission and then had our public hearings December 4th. Uh, this is um, advertised in eighth page ads in the newspaper, both for the city council and for the planning commission, as well as we sent mailed notices to all the property owners of the vacant properties, because those were the ones that were had the most 
potential for change. Uh, all the property owner requests that we had received on properties have been incorporated and accommodated in the changes that are presented to the Planning Commission and to yourself. Uh, we did have one uh, at the Planning Commission, a neighborhood resident of Menlo Estates spoke in opposition to the zoning of the parcel at the southwest corner of Fruitvale and Sanderson. Uh, it's, it's currently general plan designation is neighborhood commercial. The consistency zoning would be C1, uh, that neighborhood commercial, which is what's proposed. Uh, they wanted it to be retained as the R1 7.2. Uh, I don't know if uh, the uh, gentlemen are here tonight, but uh, at the Planning Commission, it was primarily the opposition related to a future project that is yet to come to a public hearing, more so than the general plan designation in and of itself, so more project specific. So the Planning Commission had recommended to retain the general plan, do the zoning, and have those concerns addressed uh, in the context of the project when it came forward. But of course, it's the City Council is the final determination. So in conclusion, see that wasn't so bad, was it? Uh, the, we believe this effort brings the City's zoning ordinance and map into compliance with the general plan. Uh, it incorporates current best practices for land use and development. We recognize the existing land uses and it corrects potential nonconformities and incompatibilities clarifies and simplifies the interpretation of the zoning and the map for the public, corrects in inaccuracies in the city's overall zoning districts. We believe it ultimately saves property owners and developers considerable time and money by not having to process individual zone changes when they wanted to develop their properties, and creates a general plan and zoning map and databases that are more complete, more reliable data sets to prepare growth forecasts, project overall development capacity, and achieve a desirable land use balance at the general plan build up. And to that point, and I know some of you are on, involved with uh, SCAG and WRCOG, SCAG has started their sustainable community strategy and their regional transportation program again, and so we've had to do growth forecasts. Fortunately, we had our maps, so we could be very accurate in our growth forecasts, and those are important too because those will feed into our uh, regional housing needs assessment requirements when those come around in 2020. So being able to have a good database, lowering some of those very high density residential properties to a more pro appropriate zoning, we believe, uh, we think helps with that. Also there was, just as a little anecdote, uh, state legislation passed last year uh, that now, um, states that cities cannot require, develop, cannot deny projects if they're consistent with the general plan and not the zoning. So we do think that um, this effort is, uh, is significant and will be beneficial and feel that the, our documents are aligned and we're in good shape. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about the 8,999 parcels. Does council have any comments or questions for Deanna? Uh, I want to thank you and staff for the effort that was put into this. Um, I think it's always an improvement to property values too when property owners have more flexibility in being able to develop property, especially our vacant property. So thank you for the effort that was put into that. Yes. Thank you, and you answered, because uh, my question was going to be, how is this going to, changing from, from high density to lower densities, will it have a negative <clears throat> impact when our, when our arena numbers come out? But since it's all in flux right now, and I, I think this, these changes to make it consistent with our general plan will help us, as you said, when the numbers do come out and we can, we will have backup information to say this is why this is the best for our community. And I, I do think it was a part of a correction too, just not to go too deep into that, but when we, um, when we adopted the 2020 general plan, the housing element cycle was already underway but had not been completed and right. we were under the requirement at that time from, from SCAG and the state to have 12,000 units of affordable mm -hmm. housing or different affordability levels. So, and they, uh, they had a mechanism by which they called the default density, and if you 
zone things for very high residential. So we had to allocate that on all vacant properties. So that's how the original general plan, very high density, came about and was, was allocated. Since that time, we had another housing element cycle. We did an updated housing element. We were able to work with SCAG and with the state and reduce our obligation down to 625 affordable units. And so our housing element represents the 625, which we're, we're, we're still showing here. Mm -hmm. So we're meeting all the housing element requirements, but we're not overstating uh, that very high density housing anymore because in our current uh, housing element, we are not required required to. So we do, there is still high density housing, there's still multifamily, there's a broad range of housing opportunities, but we think it's more compatible with the neighborhoods, um, the way it's been adjusted. Thank you. Good job. I have a question for our attorney. Do I need to recuse myself if our house is on here? Uh, no. The general plan and the zone change generally affect all residences within the city. And since the impact on your residence is the same as all of the rest of the council members' residence and everybody else in the city, there's no conflict. Thanks. Russ, did you have anything? Well, I uh, just want to echo uh, the compliments for the Herculean effort in this. And I really appreciate uh, pairing uh, many, many pages of, of documents and research and, and uh, adaptations to a, a very understandable presentation this evening. The, the, uh, the graphics with the pyramids was very helpful in, in understanding the process that, that uh, you and staff and consultants undertook. So uh, I do uh, echo my colleagues' appreciation for that, that work effort. And I think long term it's going to benefit us uh, uh, going forward. So thank you for that. I do want to make one more comment since Linda talked about RENA numbers. Um, I just want to point out that you guys do an outstanding job trying to meet those numbers considering that there are cities and counties up in the Bay Area that will make no effort to meet those numbers and are not afraid to say we're not even going to try. So thank you. Okay, with that, I will open the public hearing. And Mayor, as you do that, I just want to clarify for members of the public and clarify with the Community Development Director. This public hearing is a combined public hearing of items 19 and 20. Okay. So that if you're in the public and you want to talk on 19 or 20, now is the time to do that. Although we're going to have a combined public hearing, the council will have to do two separate motions for each of the items. Okay. So, Sarah, do you have anybody that wants to speak in favor of items 19 or 20? Okay. And so, therefore, there's no one in opposition. With that, I will close the public hearing. Okay. If I could, and I also want to commend uh, Nancy and your department for doing all this work. I she did she did all the grunt work. <laughs> I, I did, you know, somebody that has the passion for things like this, they walk around with this big smile on their face on these accomplish, accomplishments. We look at a 700 and some odd page staff report and say, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine going 25,000, starting at 25,000. So we commend you for doing this for the city because ultimately it helps everyone. When they stand at that counter, when, when anything is brought uh, for consideration, time isn't wasted now on inconsistencies. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. And I just want to add, Deanna, I found the t-shirt the other day. I do still have that t-shirt. My kids still tease me about we it. We gave so. her a t-shirt in 2011 on the completion of uh, the General Plan Advisory Committee work for the initial go around and it was a t-shirt with her her smiling face on the front and I don't remember what it said but it was a great accomplishment superwoman or something to that effect it, it was really kind of cool well thank you again so with that uh, could I have a motion for item number 19 I will move to approve resolution bill number 18-084 have a second second please vote And that passes 5-0. Now, could I have a motion for item number 20? 
I will move to approve Ordinance Bill 18-085, introduce and read by title only. I'll second that one, too. Thank you. Please vote. And that, too, passes 5-0. Sarah? Ordinance Bill number 18-085, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Hemet, approving zone change 18-001, amending the official zoning map to change the zone district's designations of 8,899 parcels, 5,401 acres, to make technical revisions, reflect existing land uses, and establish consistency with the general plan of land use designations in accordance with state law. Thank you. And Mayor and Council, I just want to sincerely thank you for all the time and effort and support that you've put in for us to get to this point over the 27 ordinances and now this effort. So thank you very much. Happy to do so. <laughs> uh, I'm removing item 21 from the agenda. Okay. That said, on discussion and action items, we'll move on. Since we've done item number 22, we'll move on to Item number 23, and we have our deputy city manager standing at the podium, ready for ready to give us his report. Okay, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council, members of the public. Uh, I just want to start off this presentation by saying that uh, oftentimes uh, these are difficult conversations to have. Um, oftentimes that uh, this causes, you know, angst, different uh, responses. So I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's not always a comfortable position for staff or management to be in, but sometimes we do have to have these conversations uh, moving forward. So I'll go ahead and uh, with that begin. Uh, so the background on this item, uh, I did email a copy of this PowerPoint, so you should have this in your email. There are also some handouts that Sarah is passing out. That is the exact presentation that you'll be um, hearing tonight. So at the Mayor and City Council meeting of November 13, 2018, the City Council directed staff to look into the tree trimming program and provide information related to contracting options. So what is it that we're talking about when we talk about tree trimming? Well, broadly speaking, uh, we're talking about forestry, and forestry covers all aspects of the operations, which include planning, inventorying species and their respective condition, planting, pruning, and removal of dead, diseased, and hazardous trees on or on, in or on the public right-of-way. So oftentimes we think about uh, tree trimming, but there's a whole host of other uh, items that go along with the tree trimming program and the operation. So Hemet's program uh, is housed under the Public Works Department. You can see that it is. Uh, the ultimate supervision uh, is the public works director, but we do have the refuse superintendent that oversees the program, the supervisor, uh, lead tree trimmer, uh, two tree trimmers, as well as uh, three maintenance workers that fall within uh, that breakdown. It is a total of six uh, full-time equivalents uh, broken up into uh, three crews of two. Um, some operational highlights of the program over the course of October 27 to October 2018, uh, 78 trees planted, uh, 326 trees were stumped, uh, 1,421 trees were trimmed. Uh, the city's most recent estimate shows that there are approximately 24,000 trees that are the responsibility of the city. Um, I do want to thank uh, the Public Works team, uh, the management team, for providing a lot of the information here in the presentation. Again, as I mentioned, it is a very difficult conversation to have, but uh, we did uh, receive uh, some very uh, important information uh, that is included in this report. So the tree trimming budget, uh, the operation itself is primarily funded through uh, assessment districts. So the total program cost for the operation is a little bit over $1 million. The total is at the bottom of the, the screen. Uh, 471,000 is from the pre-218 uh, assessment districts. 420,000 is in the post-218 assessment districts. 
and the general fund component of the tree trimming program is a little bit over $150,000. Uh, I've taken the budget information and I've also separated it out by personnel, maintenance and operations, as well as some of the internal service charges or other costs associated with the program. So uh, the biggest chunk of the tree trimming program is personnel, 58.1% of the tree trimming operation is personnel. So this goes to the salaries, it goes to the benefits, it goes to the PERS side of personnel. Uh, maintenance and operations is approximately $93,740. Uh, a portion of that goes to fund tree trimming of uh, the palm trees in the city. We have approximately 1,000 trees in the city. We have a contract for, uh, I believe it's $40,000 that is included in the maintenance and operation cost. Uh, liability fleet internal service charges is the next highest uh, chunk of the budget. Uh, that includes uh, liability insurance, uh, fleet costs associated for the repair, fuel, all those other costs, as well as the internal service uh, charges that all of our departments experience, IT, uh, those other costs as well. And those costs are pegged at $343,820, which is approximately 33% of the tree trimming program budget. And again, to summarize, the, type, the total program cost is a little bit over a million dollars. So Hemet's tree trimming program isn't just primarily tree trimming, a big chunk of it is. However, there is about what we approximate about 15% of the work that is done by the tree trimming crew is done on other duties as assigned. This includes uh, installation of banners, as well as decorative lighting, as well as other issues or items that may come up uh, within uh, the city's need for having things done in the community. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the city currently uses a contractor to trim 1,000 palms at a cost of approximately $40,000 per year. So what I wanted to get into now is uh, different uh, staffing models. Uh, you know, you hear about having uh, staff in-house internally that can do uh, any operation, but then there are also the uh, staffing models of having outside uh, contractors do the work. What I've provided here for the council is a matrix that highlights some of the advantages as well as some of the disadvantages that go along with uh, doing things on the in-house side. So if you look on the left, uh, hand column, uh, summarize in-house staff advantages, and I'll go over those uh, for the public and for everyone is uh, here. Uh, in-house staff advantages include uh, local ties of the community, uh, institutional knowledge. Uh, they can respond quickly to other tasks as needed. Uh, they're accountable to a uh, director. Uh, there is no administrative time needed to oversee a contract with respect to all of the work. I did mention that there is a contract that um, covers the palms, so there is still some administrative oversight that goes to administering that contract. And uh, finally, an in-house staff can respond to emergency more, emergencies more quickly. So whenever PD or fire or any other uh, event occurs and the crews are, ne are needed to respond, uh, you're more easily and more quickly able to deploy those resources when you've got the staff in-house to go ahead and do that. On the Disadvantage side, right-hand column, uh, oftentimes, and uh, I'm not speaking uh, with our specific agency, this is just a general conversation, uh, staff may have only limited experience of urban forest management. So uh, you may not be able to get the expertise that a contractor uh, is able to provide. Uh, investments must be made in equipment and maintenance, which can be very costly. As you'll recall, back in November, an item before the council was to purchase two uh, trucks that were going to be utilized by the tree trimming operation. Uh, I believe each of those trucks costed $140,000. So when you have a operation that's done internally, uh, there, there's equipment that's needed, there's uh, tools that are needed, and if the operation is conducted in-house, then there is a, a requirement or a uh, um, need to have that funded by the city. Uh, the agency should invest time and funding for obtaining and maintaining certifications, licenses, and other training as needed. Uh, I highlighted this one as well because as you'll recall in the fiscal year 18-19 budget, 
the education and training budget was reduced by about half. And so our ability to provide the needed training, um, conferences, uh, the things that keep everyone up to date on what it is that they need to be doing, obviously gets limited when uh, those types of actions are taken. Uh, removal from positions if performance is substandard can be difficult. Staff is paid irrespective of quantity, quality, or efficiency of work. The city is responsible for damage caused by workers. And the city is responsible for on-the-job injuries and workers' compensation. So now I'll focus in on contracting for services and that staffing model, starting with the left-hand uh, side. Uh, some of the advantages related to contracting for services. Uh, contractors are typically experienced and knowledgeable on a wide array of topics. Uh, they can provide a high level of knowledge on specific areas, including hazard tree identification, technical specification, and tree preservation. They can be released from service more easily. Uh, they are typically fully equipped with the necessary tools to take care of the task at hand. All certifications, licenses, and continuing education are already in place and provided by the contractor. Contractors are paid when work performed is to the satisfaction of the agency. And finally, labor is available during peak demands, and they can staff up or down based on availability of funds. On the right-hand side, we're, we'll talk about the disadvantages with contracting. These include a contract assignment may limit flexibility in job assignment. So when we talk about the 15% of the work approximately that our crews are doing, uh, the ability to flex and be flexible with the types of work that you may need those crews to do may be limited by that. If used for an extended period of time, it can be more expensive in the long run. Administrative oversight of contract is required. And finally, uh, may not respond to emergencies as quickly as, in, as in-house crews. So again, uh, the things that we do benefit by having the things uh, by the program housed or staffed internally are the things that you may lack when you decide or if you decide to contract that service out. So again, uh, just continuation of the previous uh, item. Uh, some of the advantages, again, contractor furnishes all tools, equipment, maintenance, repair. The downtown the downtime for repair or maintenance is not the responsibility of the agency. So if a truck breaks down, it's not the responsibility of the city to provide a different truck or incur the expense of having to repair that vehicle. Insurance and workers' compensation is the responsibility of the contractor. And finally, liability for damage to private and public property is the responsibility of the contractor. So with that being said, there are uh, two options that uh, are before the council. The first option is uh, to carry on the existing operation or maintain the status quo. Uh, the second option is to explore the costs and benefits of contracting. So in order to continue exploring opportunities, if that's the council's desire, and to gather more information that will help council in making an informed decision, we recommend the following if the council chooses to go down that route. And that includes uh, develop an RFP that will be given to the bargaining groups for input and then make public. And then the second item includes uh, to meet and confer with bargaining groups and negotiate in good faith with one another on matters that are within the scope of representation. And so we are bound by uh, the MOUs that are in place that require the city to meet and confer when something like this uh, is presented to uh, the city council prior to making any decision related to contracting out or not contracting out. Um, if there are any questions with respect to that, I'm sure Eric can provide some information related, related to that if the council does so wish. Um, with that being said, I'd like to open it up for discussion or questions. Are our recommendations? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Uh, open it up to council for any questions or um, concerns. One, 
relatively simple question, I think, for our city attorney. In the comparison, there's a comment made that liability for damage to private property or public property, if it's done through a contractor, it seems to me that if the city is employing the contractor to do the work, there could potentially still be liability for the city as well as the contractor. We can always guarantee that the city will be included in the lawsuit. However, every contract has not only an insurance requirement on the contractor to cover any negligence or wrongful actions of its work, so we would have that to look to, but also in a defense and indemnity agreement. So while the city probably would be sued, we would look to the contractor not only to defend us, but also to their insurer and the contractor's assets for any negligence or wrongful activity that the contractor engaged in. However, we own the street trees, and we won't move liability for a branch falling on somebody's car simply because we contract out or we remain in-house. That's irrelevant to the fact we own a piece of property, we carry the liability on a piece of property. What's happening here is we would outsource the liability for the actions of the people actually doing the work on the trees. Does that make sense? So would it be a fair statement to say that contracting doesn't negate the liability exposure for the city? It might reduce it. It mitigates or reduces it, correct. Okay. I'll stop with that for now. Okay. Linda? Good presentation. Thank you. This is always a tough one. The $40,000 outside contract on the Palms, is that included in your $93,000? Yes, that figure is included in that. I've got, and I don't know who this will go to, but I'm just going to ask the question. With the LMDs that are collected by the city to pay the maintenance for the landscaping and the tree trimming, does that continue to come in, or is all of that gone by the wayside, or is there a different type of recouping of those types of costs if you go with a contract? It wouldn't affect the LMDs at all. It may affect how much you choose to levy from the LMDs if you had some significant cost savings, but in terms of what happens to the assessments, you would continue to assess, you would continue to receive the money, and that would pay for the service. In some sense, the LMD in and of itself doesn't care where the services come from. It just provides a set amount of money for those services. And the tree trimming or the trees that are covered in the LMDs are the city-owned trees and the city right-of-ways? In some cases, yes. I'm not familiar. We have a lot of districts, and I don't know if all of the city street trees are covered by LMDs, but for the most part, I would say yes, and Chris Jensen would probably know the answer to that question. You know, this is one of, as I said, this is one of those things you have to think about for a while before I think you can make a decision or even go forward, but some other information that I would like before we consider any formal thing would be to do an informal survey of some of our surrounding cities and see what they do, how they do it, because one of the, to me, one of the major advantages of keeping this in-house is the extra things they do in the decorations and the banners. These are things that the public relies on, and they're good programs all the way through. But also, when it was down here, the can respond to emergencies more quickly. In the last several really bad storms, we've had both windstorms and rain. Nobody could have done the cleanups and the prevention and all of that better than what our employees did, and they were out there constantly with, I mean, just 
everything they had, trucks, trailers, vans, you name it. They were clearing the streets. They were, they were assisting people. They do a phenomenal job. So I think that is one of the things that really has to have a major, major uh, thought process on. Because we do. Uh, we do end up with nasty weather and nasty windstorms and whatever. But I think just, just finding some, some more basic information on, on what some of the other cities are doing. And I, I realize a lot of them surrounding us are new cities, and they probably are all contracting. Uh, but there's a few old cities like us, <laughs> Corona, Lake Elsinore. Uh, Banning, Beaumont. Banning, Beaumont, yep. These are all San Jacinto and, and even Riverside. I mean, they have had to go through the same types of things that we go through on this. And our trees are important. This is, this is one of the things that, uh, in fact, I wish we had more. And we only have 24,000. Well, that's the best information that we have up until this point. Uh, we talked earlier that there may be other portions of the community that don't, that aren't accounted for. And this is just through the LL, LL, LLMD? This, this is what we have actual record of in our records. So there may be more than that. Well, Which city of I trees. Think there are. <laughs> we have a lot of trees. We, do, we are a city of trees. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Chris's report is in response to the council asking us to look at cost savings and various functions. And so it probably needs to be looked at as a bigger picture that uh, whatever we're going to look at, we're going to have to negotiate, we're going to have to have RFPs, et cetera. Um, and so we're not necessarily advocating this. We don't have the information that you even want. Uh, but by the same, same token, based on the research that he's done, it's, it's probably obvious that no contractor is going to come in and do the kind of hands-on service, uh, the responses to the, the customers, the, the citizens, uh, that our own staff does. And so uh, while we can provide all the information, uh, my guess is going to be when we get to the bottom line, you're going to keep the six individuals. And so what I'm really asking is, do you really want us as a staff to provide you the information that you're desiring uh, when I kind of sense uh, the will of the council is going to be that we're going to keep this in-house? I would like to find out from some of our surrounding older cities whether they do total in-house, whether there's a, a split on a contract, how do they manage their urban forests? Because we actually need to do a better job. I think we need more trees in Hemet. That's my personal opinion. And uh, but there are a lot of there's a lot of grant funding out there for urban forests right now. So you know, it's I think we have to be very intelligent about what, what we're looking at it, how we're looking at it, but also, I mean, all of the in-house staff advantages. I look at that and I'm going, yeah, you're absolutely right. But then. I, we've got to look at the monetary thing. We absolutely have some protection on PERS and exactly what that does to all the budgets. One of the items that this report did not cover uh, is something that I think Alan was alluding to, which includes, you know, best management practices in the world of uh, urban forestry and what that means for a public works agency or a city agency. And so that wasn't a, a component of this. And so, I, you know, when you're talking about uh, some of the other things related to response, emergency response. Um, I understand that that's a great um, concept or that's, that's great to have. The other component that, you know, I want to tell the council that we did not look into is the best management practices and what that means to um, whether it's tree trimming on a grid cycle, a grid pattern, those types of things that uh, typically you do when you evaluate a program were not a component of this. One of the things that Chris and I have been talking about is this is basically, and it's evolved this way over the decades, a complaint-oriented organization. I think that's what a lot of the politics are about. It's what the people expect. Um, and most of the interaction that I have with the council usually deals with following up on a complaint. Now, you can have a grand plan for 24,000 trees, uh, but 
most of our direction is going to be is take care of an individual's complaint. Tree fell on a car or, or whatever, whatever it may be. And so we're taking a look at how do you, you do planning uh, like Deanna does uh, very well, but how do you do planning and still have an organization that's primarily responsive to the citizens or the builders? Or, so that's an element that we're looking at. So I, I'm just throwing that out there because uh, it's going to come up in the budget discussions. Uh, the whole thought of one-stop shopping for building permits and developers, developers is that same kind of concept. How do you provide that customer-oriented service? And, and so uh, while we're coming to you with, you know, you have a lot of choice here, I still feel, and Chris does too, we've talked about it, the organization has to start oriented to itself to customer response, consumer response. Uh, uh, and that ought to be a, the top priority of what we're doing. So that's just a generic expounding on some of the conversations that we're having. Uh, the, the budget, as it rolls over from year to year, doesn't necessarily talk about that. And it's not strategically talked about with the citizenry. Well, I think we paid, like most cities, uh, uh, some effort to be responsible to the citizens, but I think each of you uh, can find examples of uh, people waiting to be serviced at the counter, and uh, the individual is not at the, you know, at the serving that particular. He'll wait, uh, or she'll wait, etc. And so we really need to take a look at that. So even this program needs to be looked at in that context too. Uh, is it appropriate to wait three weeks? to do a tree response, a response to an, 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 you know, a tree that needs trimming, or, or three months sometimes because that's the way it's programmed, or can we become more responsive and be effective? I don't think there's any way you can program 24,000 trees uh, to be done, you know, once every 17 years. You, you just can't do that. And so we need to come up with a program which is much more consumer-oriented, customer-oriented. And, well, speech. and it's all about customer service at the most cost effective in the most cost effective way so I, I think our team does an incredible job for the amount of work they have to do six six people for a town this size uh, is incredible that of what gets done as it is and 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 there's a lot that needs to get done but um, we still have to do our due diligence, and I, um, I agree with uh, city manager with regards to best management practices. We need to really, really look at that. Um, so I want to thank you for putting this together. Um, it, it brings a lot of things to light, and even though sometimes contracting seems like a great idea, uh, sometimes the customer service means um, contracting to enhance 